This is Inspiring Design, where unique innovators come together to share their knowledge, share their insight, and keep us up to date with the latest industry trends. And here's your host, Rashan Senanayak. What's up, listeners? We are live with episode 15 of Inspiring Design with Rashan. Today is going to be all about landscape architecture, and we have a very special guest here today, Damien Thompson. He's one of the founding directors of Lab 27, a multidisciplinary landscape architecture firm. He's been in the industry for over 25 years, partaking in award-winning projects all over Australia and the UK. He also gives back a lot by lecturing and tutoring as well. And Damien, welcome and thank you for giving up your time. Cheers, Rochelle. Nice to have you in. Good to chat. You're welcome. Um, can we start off with a little bit of background and experience on yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, so I have a degree in landscape architecture and uh, we'll talk a bit about what that means in a second. But um, what led me to that was I was always curious about the way things worked and about design as a way of explaining how things worked and I had lots of questions as a kid. I spent a lot of time outside. I wasn't really a fan of being inside for too long, so I have a great love of the outdoors. Yeah. Combined with that creative kind of enthusiasm. You're in um, the right industry then? Yeah, yeah. We went through a whole list of different design professions, you know, from planning to architecture to um, industrial design, yeah. uh, which was why QUT was great because it had all those things in the one sort of stream when I went through. Yeah. Um, and uh, first choice was landscape architecture and, and I haven't budged since. I've, it's been a great way to see the world. Yeah. You know, it's great when you're traveling to understand how places work, how cities work. Um, and that's the kind of uh, reason why I got into it really, love of travel, love of being outside and, uh, you know, a penchant for just drawing all the time. Just yep. always comes out <laughs> drawing on anything. So uh, good outlet for my, uh, you know, enthusiasm. That's great, actually. And um, can we start off with a little bit of understanding? One of the biggest misunderstandings even I think I have is what is landscape design and what's landscape architecture? Sure, sure. Um, how, how can we draw the line between them sure. two? Uh, well, they're both design uh, practices or processes, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, landscape architecture comes with a certified degree um, you know, ratified by the Institute of Landscape Architects. and Yeah. Landscape designers also have, there are other kind of industry bodies out there that control some of that, um, um, uh, you know, some of those projects. Mm -hmm. uh, I think landscape architecture has the reputation, certainly has the numbers as well to tackle large, complex, interdisciplinary projects, city scale things, as much as, you know, private residential landscapes. Yeah. Um, in my experience, and this isn't always the case, but in my experience, landscape designers are a little more at the sort of smaller site scale mm -hmm. of things. And um, there's some amazing people out there that haven't got a degree in landscape architecture that are massively um, enthusiastic about planting design and the way that all goes together. So there's lots of pathways in, mm -hmm. but if you want to tackle large civic projects, um, typically involving urban designers and architects and engineers and so on, uh, you need to be a landscape architect. So it's probably the higher level of tertiary qualification, if you like. So it's almost um, a chartered version? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Give or take, yeah. So I'm a registered landscape architect and the Institute has to vet members of, uh, yeah, that we've got to meet the code mm -hmm. of the industry, um, the association, and, the, and also we've got to uphold the values of the Institute of Landscape Architects as well. Yeah. Um, so that's a way that they can, if you like, maintain the quality of the community of landscape architects. And it's a very broad church. You've got people operating almost at a planning level where they're looking at um, the interface of land use against natural systems at a macro scale, you know, Fraser Island, wow, yep. White Bay Burnett, visual assessment of all of that. So what is it? We always, you know, get camping. Easter's just come past and everyone's jumping in their cars and heading off into the countryside in South East Queensland. The quality of that experience is really at the heart and soul of what a landscape architect um, works with day to day. So what is it about these amazing natural places and urban places, city centres, um, that gets people really excited and packing the streets and malls and plazas and parks? So yep. we, we have to kind of understand all of that. And in the same 
breath, literally. <laughs> We've got to make sure that all of the attendant natural systems are kept um, happy, you know, at a level that they can sustain that kind of growth. So in the past, I've worked on bits of Fraser Island, for example, that were quite, they were loved to death, mm-hmm. you know, um, Lake Mackenzie being one of them. Mm-hmm. And um, our strategy there with national parks at the time was to actually, well, maybe people shouldn't be parking so close to the edge of that amazing cultural and natural landscape. Mm-hmm. So hard, hard call, but we pulled the coaches and buses and four-wheel drive back up the hill away and you had to walk in. Yeah. So you had to engage with the landscape on foot. So you have to have a, I think, quite a good understanding of your morality and values as well, of what's important. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your ethical position is critical, really. Yeah. And, you know, we kind of see ourselves as the honest broker between human systems and natural systems in a way, you know. Yeah. Culturally... I actually really like that. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a nice place to dwell, but God, so it can be very frustrating because you're dealing... Um, in a very emotive area. Mm. So your skills as a designer um, and as a landscape architect specifically have to cover off a lot of that. So we will get involved with a lot of community consultation. Mm-hmm. The best way to understand how a place should be used is to talk to the people that live and breathe it every day, obviously. So that's you. I really, really love that part of the practice. So you, you're not sitting in an office trying to dream up something. That's not what it's about. You're, yeah. you're actually hearing from people that have been going there for the last 30 years or may have just moved into the area and they need, you know, they've got young kids or whatever. And you're grabbing all of that intel and all of that enthusiasm and trying to create a great place outcome yeah. from all of that. Yeah, cool. I'm actually going to ask you a quite a random question because <laughs> um, this just well, came in. three into... minutes in. <laughs> random questions already. <laughs> this, this was, um, it, it's been something on my mind. Do landscape architects design golf courses? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do they? Yeah, um, and typically it's um, because they like playing golf. Okay, <laughs> that's the correlation I've picked up in my in my career to date. <laughs> right, you've got to, you've got to really love it, and I I have uh, you know dallied in a bit of golf over the years myself. Mm-hmm. It's not for me. Um, that's been made very clear. My father's very good. No, I'm not good wow. um, at it. It's, it's a patience concentra- concentration span thing. I yeah, think. Um, but certainly it is a version of landscape. Um, Traditionally, 80s, 90s, start of this century, very sculpted, typically, and very, um, it's like, you know, trying to organise nature. Nature doesn't like, you know, to be organised. It yep. wants to bust out and do its own thing. That's what's beautiful about it for me. Some contemporary golf courses are actually getting into that and actually using local salt marshes, multi-species mixes and different edge wow. conditions and tidal areas. Uh, I think RQ a few years ago now, but RQ in Queensland deployed a similar kind of design tactic for their golf course and it made it a very site-specific thing. So whilst I don't play there, that approach to landscape excites Mm -hmm. me. Um, You've got great land managers in golf courses that are kind of so in the detail for drainage, soil mixes, um, wind conditions, all of plant species suitability, all of that, but they can really uh, go to town on that. But some firms specialise in that and takes them around the world. Yeah, wow. Well, there you go. That was um, that was just for my own stint. Uh, I think I just... it's not dissimilar <laughs> to resorts, actually. Oh, in a yep. lot of ways, a very similar, and often the two go hand in hand. Traditionally, they have now. Yeah. Uh, resorts are a bit more eco-sensitive. If, yeah. If you can use that term these days, but trying to get embedded in a natural forest for example or a yeah. cliff top and be really bedded into that landscape yeah, yeah. Um, but in the old days yeah golf and tourism very very good uh, friends yeah definitely no I, I think um, it, it makes perfect sense when you, when you explain it like yeah. that and um, so the way I'm seeing this is similar to architecture that's given that's my background I see this as a landscape designer is more like a building designer and the landscape architect is the registered architect at that Holistic, uh, larger yeah, level. That's probably a reasonable yeah. comparison. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, and and certainly that level of qualification is in no way a reflection of the skills of the individuals involved, and it's it's um it's purely just a a path um, from an education perspective that they've taken typically, and and their appetite for taking on mm-hmm. uh, more complex, riskier things. Yeah. Yeah. Now that makes sense. And um, so in in terms of becoming a 
registered landscape architect what's the process so for example the architecture industry you need to have your bachelor's your master's then go yeah. sit for the exam yeah. and interview and so on is there a very arduous process it's pretty landscape? similar to that okay really. um you've got to be put for well, you can nominate yourself and then be seconded second by someone um quite often there's a mentorship program i think architects have got a log book mm-hmm. yeah keep yep um the registration process for this institute pretty sure it doesn't need a logbook but it's it's a documented process so I have mentored people through the system before um, and certainly we had to keep records of all of our engagement with you know between that individual and and me here yeah um, there are certain topics you've got to cover off and be knowledgeable on and they they're just really understanding what kind of questions you're going to be asked when you get to the interview as well mm-hmm. um, you know, to make sure that you're ready to ready to go and sort of run autonomously in the industry as a landscape architect. Mm-hmm. So that's uh, yeah, it's quite similar to the architectural process in theory. You know. um, but I, I quite enjoy the mentoring component of it. It's it's a nice way to actually uh, test some of your own understanding actually of where things are going, and you can also bring in other experts like in property law, which is a big part of the professional kind of um, responsibilities of what we do. Mm-hmm. Think simply about if you design a public plaza uh, and it's going to be used for big events, thousands of people, um, you need a level of rigour to the detailing of the, the pavement, the steps. The, there are you know, national standards that need to be deployed to ensure that it's a certified and safe um, Place in that mode, so mm-hmm. you've got to you've got to understand all of your legal responsibilities and of duty of care is, is a huge part of what we do in public yeah. domain design. So, is um, at a base level the the education qualification is it just a bachelor's, or do they require masters? Well, in as Queensland, well? the, it it differs between universities. Um, you need to have um, post grad to become an RLA, mm-hmm. um, and. QT at the moment, they're shifting to more a double degree approach to things. So pairing um, Bachelor of Design is, I think, the, what, what they're calling it now. Yeah, it's the Bachelor of Design and then you specialise either in a spatial exploration, which is another word for, I think, a fancy way of saying architecture. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm not okay. actually sure. what That's as of this year. Um, I'm not sure what the name for landscape is at the moment. Well, there are a few space cadets in the design world, so <laughs> spatial exploration is not a bad kind of mindset, really. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, yeah, so you can, you can pair up landscape architecture as an undergrad at the moment mm-hmm. with business or you know, other allied sort of um, interests and uh, they're working on a post-grad course which will allow them to be certified is my understanding. Mm-hmm. So they go through the mentorship program following the bachelor's or during their studies? To get registered? Yeah. After. Yeah. After. So you've graduated, you've done your four years and then um, you've worked for a bit typically um, and then uh, you put your case forward that you've got enough experience to, to get registered. Yeah. I'm not sure exactly on the time, post-graduation, but I think it's um, a minimum of a couple of years or a few years, but yep. don't quote me on that. Yep. <laughs> There's a, the QUT website's fantastic for all of that. It is changing a bit at the moment, so mm-hmm. it's really worth getting in touch with them if you want to study in Queensland and yep. uh, have a chat to someone about it so that you're completely com- comfortable with where you're going. And um, is there an actual examination process to gain that registration? After the mentorship? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So you'll sit an exam yeah. uh, with a selected committee from the institute and yeah. they will judge your worthiness. <laughs> I think that's the most daunting and uh, obviously uh, I went down a different pathway from that conventional architectural yeah. practice. I never experienced it. But um, I've heard with the high pass uh, fail rate, it's one of the most stressful things that you can go through. What's it like in landscape? Uh, it's been a while since I've done it, but um, <laughs> it's no different to that. So people uh, freak out about um, public speaking, uh, and this is probably just another version of that, mm-hmm. where you've got to um, know your stuff. You know, So uh, the best thing, the advice that we give to people is that uh, don't, don't try and be the every person in these interviews, because as I mentioned before, mm-hmm. it's a very broad profession from detailed site-based design, residential work, small spaces, all the way up to big picture policy thinking so always lean towards your strengths and um, because that's what you know about yeah so the best way to answer some of those questions that will come at you um, 
you know, and you'll know the topics generally when you get in there, mm-hmm. is to always have a few good examples of your life and lived examples. So not something you read, but something um, you've applied in your practice prior to that point that you can refer to, good and bad, you know, things that haven't haven't worked. So the ones that examples for uh, example on site through construction, you know, sometimes we we get uh, a builder, you know pushing someone on site to make a decision um, it's always best if you're not sure at the point uh, that you're there in fact in most cases to just bring it back to the studio and refer it to your mentors and you know directors in the studio if you're not sure and that that's your prerogative so similar to um, to most parts of the process really yep. get it to a point if you're feeling uncomfortable and not sure then it's your right to say look you know I think there's something in this but without committing to anything I'd like to just go back to the studio with that one um, the professional answer. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And and take that time. You know? Yeah. Always have that in the back of your mind. I think that's sound advice, regardless of the industry. I think that's yeah. that's a good yeah. way to approach it. Yeah. Do you um so? Is your there colleagues a will thank you for it. What's yeah. that? Sorry. Your colleagues will thank you for it. Yeah, well, definitely. Oh, yeah. It gets them involved in the process. Everyone feels like they're part of the team. Yeah, and you shortcut any potential issues that might be there. Yeah. No, that's it. And um, is there a written component and an interview, or is it different? You're not sure yet? <laughs> uh, uh, there is your... Um, the interview is obviously verbal and face-to-face, um, mm-hmm. and I'm pretty sure you've got to have records of your uh, the way you've approached through the mentorship program. But uh, Yeah, okay, don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure there's a, a workbook of, of sorts, but it's not as onerous, I don't think, in landscape architecture as the architects where they've got a lot of hours mm-hmm. to tasks and things. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, you certainly need to demonstrate, you know. It's important. Um, look, it would be important regardless to to pull together your position mm-hmm. on being a registered landscape architect, and I'm sure it's part of the formal process as well. Just didn't check that for today but have a look on the website uh, for the Institute of Landscape Architects and uh, there's an enormous amount of fantastic material there of course no, that, I think that makes sense and you've been in the industry for quite a long time so yeah. I, w- I wasn't expecting you to <laughs> know exactly what's happening yeah. today but uh, let's talk a little bit about the skills that a landscape architect needs the hard skills and the soft skills what uh, what what are the critical skills that the young designers need to develop if this is the pathway they're thinking of taking? Um, you need to be a very good listener, um, and you need to be a very good communicator. And they're not always things that people uh, think about when you say the word design. Mm-hmm. There is a general, you know, in my family and, and friends, there's a general. Um, sense that we just sit in here with big fat markers and dream up ideas uh, solo but um, knowing the briefs really important you know what is, what are we doing here you know, mm-hmm. why are we here why is a good question just yep. keep asking that one yeah be annoying with it you know. self-reflection yeah and definitely knowing your own personal baggage and history mm-hmm. so we I think I said before but we, we kind of try and think of ourselves as honest brokers in the design process yeah you don't know everything um, and there are others out there that aren't at the table that need to have a voice in the conversation about design, particularly future residents in a, in a thing you're designing or um, existing residents mm-hmm. that might be against a creek, for example, that you're about to do some work on. So you've got to bring their thoughts and aspirations to the fore. So that requires a bit of imagination, but it also requires a bit of organisation to make sure you've done all the research before you start to mm-hmm. get those chunky pens out. Yep. So skills, um, a, a live sketching skill, even if it's just a simple vignette diagrammy level of, of um, quality, can get um, can be so useful in a meeting. You, know, you might travel somewhere to do something, you might have a great presentation, um, but the conversation might go off in a different direction and, mm-hmm. and the client might be saying, well, actually... Um, I'd like that creek bridge crossing to be back up here for uh, hydrological reasons, you know, the flow, the flood or whatever. We've got to move it around. And so you need to be able to get the pan out, um, and that can mean a stylus as well. And we've got touchscreen laptops here that we travel with, and I, I really have got into the, the little pan markup over the existing drawing yep. tool, which is a nice, quick way to just go, well, here's what we're talking about as of last night. Here's the conversation. We can move this over there. And then you've got a digital record, and I can just email that sketch off to the team or the client or whatever we need to do. So 
quick communication skills, verbal and sketching, uh, super useful. Even if you're not a natural sketcher, just just train yourself Practice. to be able to work on a drawing which um, breaks down your thinking, so breaks down the hierarchy of issues, what's a really critical burning issue, um, and use your skills as a sketcher to try represent that at a, at a design level. So. We need to prioritise things. There's only so much energy you can put into certain things and time is ticking in most cases in a design kind of world, as you know, and of course. you've got to cut to the chase. So a drawing at a meeting or um, even a few dot points at a meeting can just get everyone that's there to agree on a position. You can then take that away and flesh it up. Just flesh it out. Yeah. Obviously later on, but that's a good skill. So listening, um, communicating, keeping in touch with your clients, you know, mm-hmm. offline, out of meetings, through the week, quick call. Um, I saw this thing. Uh, I read, I read uh, a news report. Even you know, it might relate to the politics of the project. Um, what's your feeling on that? Do you think it has any bearing? Um, just develop a, a relationship with your project and with with the team that's around it on the client side. Um, I find that really rewarding in a way because you get to know the real kind of drivers behind what you're doing. And mm-hmm. quite often you can go if you don't have that. If you don't invest in that relationship, you can spend a lot of time. Um, spinning your wheels for something that no one really wants yeah so really just keep talking to as many people as possible and listen to what they're saying take notes and get them to you know agree to those before you go too far yeah yeah i think that's very valuable advice i think even from a business context that applies really well yeah um in terms of the software skills what are the main softwares that landscape architects dabble in um, this is uh, an interesting question because it, it does vary a bit between studios and it comes to your own personal baggage in a way. Like what <laughs> some people just can't get out of MicroStation. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm talking computer aided drafting is one genre and desktop publishing is another. Uh, I think most people are kind of into Adobe, the Adobe suite, mm-hmm. um, InDesign, Photoshop, um, Illustrator, you know, and there's hardcore debates in the studio about when Illustrator is more appropriate than InDesign or Photoshop <laughs> and I step out of that I don't really yeah. I just need it in the report and it needs to be really um, clear and a rock and roll kind of <laughs> outcome I don't <laughs> so so I'm kind of I'm more in the as I mentioned the digital markup and a lot of sketching by hand and mm-hmm. a lot of yellow trace over printed out base plans to scale mm-hmm. um, and a lot of sections sections are also super useful um, but even better than that is in terms of Software we use SketchUp a lot, uh, and it's becoming a very, very valuable tool for us, both at a very primary block model 3D in space mm-hmm. um, kind of scenario where you're just trying to test the forms and volumes, right through to really detailed and, and rich um, 3D immersive environments that you can get a sense of the scale and texture of things, and, you know, where the sun's coming through and, yeah. and the animated shop frontages that. Could want, you know, you can change the mood of a place if you've got dead walls and service cupboards, you know, yep. um, or you've got uh, a little street library and you've got some a great little restaurant and a bookshop or something. That's a totally different vibe. So a lot of our the end game for us is to try and portray an emotion, how you feel in a place, and so we use whatever tools we can get our hands on. Sometimes we'll use and we've, on the wall behind you. There's some composite images of um, hand sketches rendered in Photoshop over a CAD survey or a photo with a sketch over the top of that um, to get some texture. Always go with original imagery. (laughs) Yeah. That's really important. Spend the time getting a library together of photos you and your team have taken, textures, places. Um, Just stay away from that whole copyright issue of internet grab bag Mm -hmm. um, if you can. You can, you can, we build up little montages of textures of things from other places we've taken images of um, to get a sense of a place but the primary goal for all designers should be that it's very place specific or very client specific in the outcome whether it's an object that you're designing for a particular person with a different range of mobility and a prosthetic design or anything like that um, a place has a similar mindset in that it's it's got its own subterranean systems drainage soil uh, geology um, buried artifacts you know uh, attendant vegetation is a function of those three or four things plus the microclimate, you know, one side of the hill versus the other, daylight, water, um, runoff, um, human cultural overlays, you know, when was it logged? We were just talking this morning about a national park project we're working on, a lookout 
at a uh, the top of the Gold Coast, and it used to be a barren, grassy hill. So did Mount Kutha here. It used to call it One Tree Hill. Yeah. Now you know, I ride my bike up there, and it's a lovely, re-emerging eucalypt forest. Yeah. So there's this time factor you've got to think of. One thing the landscape architects do, I think, more than most other design professions, is have a strong handle on um, time. Yeah. What's the... Because it takes a long time for a landscape of, of scale to emerge from a blank site. Yeah. Is there a rule of thumb or like a lifespan that you aim for as a, as a designer? Uh, at its at least intergenerational. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so some parts of designs can be more ephemeral based on, um, you know, the seasons or, or whatever. But I think we always aim for an outcome which is going to help multiple generations in the future um, better appreciate that place so we often you know refer to the bones of a design you know what are the kind of the pillars of a scheme and that's not just physical things it's it's community things as well like an engagement with the local community means more than a an expensive design outcome because yeah. it then has life and that's what that's what we're trying to facilitate you know, yeah definitely great places so it has to be in a generational you've got to think about um, those that are coming after us in the context of those that have gone before us and made their decisions, but we're at a point now where we need to use the most of the embodied energy in all of our components in public space so they can be there and operate at a high level for a long time. Mm -hmm. So you've got that argument about, you know, for example, the stone paving um, is more durable and will last forever, but it's more expensive. So the immediate cost cycle program is different to the the end game, which is for it to be there for a very long time. Yeah, I think this is where that um, your ethical standing comes into play quite a bit and that consciousness of, of being aware what happens at that um, ne next generation and bringing that educated guess into play so that um, you can make those decisions and try to convince that client to pay a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a tricky one, um, but a good way to do that is to, we all have aspirations, you know, we would travel overseas to see amazing places, you know, Piazza you Navona, know, you go to the shops, so, you know, you, you go to these incredible places and you don't, you know, most people don't realise why, you know, why they love it. Mm -hmm. So we try and break that down into its components and then we use that as ammunition when we're designing a similar kind of place for a similar kind of outcome somewhere else. You can point to some of those well-trodden uh, public squares and gardens that almost everyone's been to, you know, mm -hmm. Central Park in New York. Yeah? Yep. Everyone kind of knows about it at least. Um, but what they probably don't realise is that in our context, Central Park is is like going to the Gateway Bridge over the river and then looking kind of northwest-ish <laughs> to the Brecky Creek Hotel. Yeah. That's the length of that park. And it's, wow. And it's, I think, one and a half times wider than the river at that point. So that one park in the middle of New York City is massive. Mm. You know, it's made up of a thousand parks. Yeah. But so an example of scale. So somebody, um, quite often our clients or, or someone will say, oh, you know, it's, it's going to be like, uh, it's going to be like Rockhampton Central Park. <laughs> and we go, well, yeah, philosophically, yes, it should be the, the central gathering place and do all those things. Um, but did you know that, you know, that park is massive. So, and it's got a whole lot of cultural institutions around it and it works in a very specific way. So using examples of great places to try and elevate the task at hand for you is, is a good technique. Yeah. Here's a random question. <laughs> you mentioned artifacts and being aware of that and that might be part of the site that you're working with. Yeah. Have you ever come across any Indian burial grounds or mummies or book dinosaur bones or anything like that? <laughs> No, not those ones. Okay. Um, uh, a good one that popped into my mind then was when I was doing a bit of work, um, when I was at uni, I got this great um, placement in London in between undergrad and postgrad, uh, which was run between QUT and a few other universities. And the one that I was on was with Cambridge University and QUT. I don't know if it still exists, but it was um, a fantastic eye-opener for me, mm -hmm. you know, kind of straight up, put my last assignment in, jumped on a plane um, and went over to London for wow. four months and then came back. And part of the deal was, and so the, one of my uni lecturers helped with the submission for a few of us to get over there. Um, the deal was that you got a job over there. Um, 
for most of that time, uh, which allowed you to sit inside a design studio in a different place and really kind of soak up another way of thinking about practice. And one of the jobs we weren't working on, but we were over on the south side of London in a place called Southwark, which I can never really pronounce correctly, but there's a fantastic market over there. Um, it's sort of sort of southeast of um, the centre of... It's near the old city. And they were excavating on the edge of the Thames and they uncovered a Roman amphitheatre. Wow. Yeah, and that's what I thought. And so I'm, I'm just, you know racing down to the riverbank to try and have a look through the construction hoarding and you couldn't really see very much and by the time I got back up to the office that afternoon um, they told me oh yeah we just took photos of it and then covered it in <laughs> and I, I, I remember just sort of falling off my chair going what is this irresponsible um, but they come across these things in Europe and in the UK all yeah. the time and so they have a very different it's got to do with the local politics and all of that, don't get me wrong. Um, but that was one example of, uh, you know, and they say in Rome, for example, you know, you can't, you can't lift up a piece of paving without discovering some amazing artefact over there. Mm. One thing that we need to get better about, and we've done this recently, um, the starting at Oxley Creek, is mapped out the, um, the potential sites for uh, cultural artefacts along the banks of that creek. Um, so that the first people, the first Australians and, and their kind of layered existence for thousands and thousands of years can be respected in a contemporary master planning sense, mm-hmm. knowing that we, we are yet to kind of ground truth any of that. But we mm-hmm. have got a through, we used the, uh, an amazing lady from the University of Queensland as a, one of our um, colleagues on the project, and she mapped out where it was likely to be a place of habitation and gathering mm-hmm. along the corridor, for example. So we didn't actually find anything in that case. But in that project, we did find some of the um, things you don't want to find. Um, lots of areas that had been in previous land uses, um, dumps for all sorts of unsavoury items, um, down to there was an old abattoir location, for example. I won't elaborate, but mm-hmm. uh, you know the landscape had been used as a dump in some locations, and that is common around the world as well. So, um, some things you want to find and cherish and tell those stories, and some things you probably need to still tell that story, but <laughs> you need a really solid way of dealing with it, yeah. particularly in a in a waterway, so that there are no contaminants leaching around the place. So, yeah. So, uh, geotechnical investigations and and um, cultural. Um, studies are really critical parts at the beginning of most pro- projects we work on. Yeah, I think that um, I'm noticing this pattern emerging where you mentioned the whole thing of getting to know and uh, listening being one of the first skills you mentioned mm. and getting to know the brief and thinking at that intergenerational um, level spending time with the community that whether they're moving in or they've been living there for ages I feel like this is pointing towards design thinking and at, at a holistic level, how does design thinking come into play as a landscape architect? Well, we have a kind of catch cry here um, where we think of design at all scales and you could parallel the way humans observe and interact with landscapes um, in a similar way. Mm-hmm. So. Um, At a very sensory, personal level, there are elements in every design where we try and tease out um, a a deeper connection with nature. You know, that's kind of part of the gig here. It's trying to make sure that we're trying to wake people up to the amazing um, sensory experiences that surround us. Mm -hmm. So in an urban setting, um, you know, there's competing demands, but they can come down to even just seasonal flowering, you know, trying to get a sense of the, of the march of time through the year by using plants that do different things in different times of the year and tell you that they're like a kind of planet clock, you know, they, they let you know what's going on. And, and those stories, like when the, the wattles flower at Stradbroke and the Kondamooka clan would know that the mullet were running, you know, there's a, there's a sort of deeper storytelling thing that, um, you know, I don't profess to know a huge amount about them. What I've what I kind of had gleaned over the years has just been uh, fascinating and awe-inspiring as a landscape architect. You know, that kind of pre-European history of this place, um, but it's uh, all about the senses in many ways. And then 
that's the human condition, how we, you know, the texture of things, the materials when you sit down, um, the warmth of the timber as opposed to the cold concrete that you might have specified for a seat. Mm -hmm. The location of that seat so that it catches the winter sun but also gets good summer shade. Right? So you're kind of dealing with these planetary forces all the time and these yep. seasonal flows to get connections um, to human. And that's the human spirit. And we do a lot of work in um, the wellness landscape kind of realm at the moment. So that goes back to mental health. Um, you know, I think almost half in Australia, um, between the ages of 10 and 24, half of the health issues um, are mental in our wow. country. And it's increasing. So it's been proven that... Um, you know, healing rates in hospital situations. If you've got a view, a connection to external landscape, your chances of recovering faster are increased. Not mm. in every case, obviously, but generally speaking, mm -hmm. there's some great studies in Europe at the moment that are giving us good data on what that means. So yeah. it's no longer just, oh, yeah, I like to, I like to look out the window. We've well, this is the thing. Um, I actually recently learned um, the importance of grounding and yeah. being actually barefoot on grass or yeah. on a beach or something like that, the actual physiological differences it yeah, has yeah. to us as opposed to walking around on a tile or wearing shoes 100% of the time. Yeah. It sounds a little hippie to some people, but it's, I feel like there's way more importance in going back to that, oh, yeah. the roots like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's some really good strategies that we're starting to deploy across our projects now that deal with the subtle ways that you can make people... Um, you know, happier and healthier, mm -hmm. and that. So it's for a long time we've been banging on about the obesity epidemic and the, you know um, the fact that sitting is the new smoking and and you know the physical side of of our health and well-being, mm -hmm. but the mental side of our health and well-being is a is a, an area that isn't as well kind of understood yet, but it's becoming really well um, interrogated yep. at an academic level yep. and is giving us some fantastic tips, things like. Um, you know, we've been involved with uh, health design, for example, hospitals um, and dementia garden design and things like that where, you know, you need to have links back to a seat detail from the 50s because what happens with some forms of dementia is that your immediate memory goes but your deeper long-term memory remains or is, is better. And so having physical elements like a telephone booth, you know, or, or a, an old 70s phone in a room yeah. can trigger lots of other memories by association. So, um, and then engaging the senses is really important. So having more fluid, dynamic forms, less gridded, structured, orthogonal forms apparently has a direct impact on mental health. And just think about it. You go for a bushwalk, you go for a surf, you know, you walk on the sand. You know, the old saying, there are no straight lines in nature. It kind of rings true, but there's a deeper connection that we make at a kind of reptilian brain level mm. with those feelings that help us recuperate. It's why we go camping. It's why we travel. You know, it's why we go for a walk. Yeah. So how do you gather that data though in a from a practical point of view of going through that process? How do you gather that data? Like do you research is this where you physically go out and talk to the community and is it focus groups or is it online or is it a combination of everything? Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a combination hot pot to be mm -hmm. honest of, of lots of different tech. There's some interesting practices looking at, um, for example, mapping through mobile phone data where people go. Mm -hmm. So you can interrogate to quite a fine level of detail, anonymously, of course, where in public spaces people are hanging out and, and yeah. then perhaps start to deduce why. And it could be a microclimatic thing, as I mentioned before. It could be a, a land use thing, like mm -hmm. that's where the stages for the gig or, you know, it could be all sorts of different factors. But there's interesting supporting tech happening now to help us understand where people go and then it's up to us to try and divine why not every job has the fortunate position of getting direct community engagement normally there's a few layers between uh, the design team and the community and um, the more complex the project um, the more rigorous that becomes because each project of, of scale has to stand up to public scrutiny it has to have deep engagement with community um, and there are some great firms out there that uh, like co-design that um, are really amazing at bringing that community engagement at a, at a real deep you know, personal level to a project and to a design outcome. So we want to work with those guys a lot. We want to work with um, people that are able to give us a good bead on you know, a few years of data on a place, um, why people through the seasons, winter, summer, why they're going where they're going. Yeah. 
um, uh, we find you know that's quite exciting starting to tap into more of that but the more um, and then there's kind of the, the open open day community consultation sort of things that we do a lot of as well where mm-hmm. you've um, you sent the online media out you've uh, down at Coffs Harbour recently the client the council there actually was, was you know, hand delivering things so some of that more old school consultation process is still really critical so yeah. you're trying to imagine all the major food groups of consultation um, and get as many of those into your project as possible and it just makes it a richer uh, more relevant design outcome as a result so digital analog <laughs> everything in between where uh, the time. information comes from I think that, yeah. yeah and giving things a bit of time to settle as well yeah uh, is important so the more time you've got to get a good read on the community the better yeah definitely it, it makes sense that, uh, as a designer having to understand the end user, but I, you, in this case, other than a um, maybe a design, an architect who's designing for a wealthy individual might only have one target audience to actually focus in. Yeah, you have yeah. almost endless and people that aren't even been conceived yet. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah, so you've got to you've got to kind of think like a futurist, I think. Yeah. To be a good landscape architect, you've got to, you know, take all that seriously. Like it's not you know, you're not there just to exercise your own personal whims. Um, you're there to actually set the mm. city or the planet up for a better, richer outcome. Yeah. When you're gone. Right? So no, I love it. And you've already mentioned things like the whole mobile data um, mm. analysis and the digital and the analog combination. How do you see this fourth industrial revolution of technology change affecting landscape as a discipline with VR, AR, and AI coming into play? Um, how, do you, how do you see the next 5 to 10, 20 years of landscape architecture? It's pretty exciting. Um, we, uh, there's some very early you know, VR tech out there which is useful um, we still think that the receiving kind of audience you know clients and community and so on still can get static or, or video 3D output on a screen mm-hmm. kind of outcomes um, but the VR overlay once you've got a good 3D model cooked up um, and populated with the right kind of you know, assets so that it's telling as much or as little detail as relevant to the point in time um, you can easily strap the goggles on and go for a play as long as you don't get nauseous long way, which is the, <laughs> is the kind of current and we'll get over that and then yeah. I don't know where Google, Google Glass is going but the mm-hmm. whole HoloLens heads up display um, you know augmented reality yep. uh, thing is really exciting and uh, it's just, just a step before Bionic Man kind of stuff with, with yep. uh, integrated <laughs> units in your body um I'm sure that'll come, um, but the, what, the the goal has to be not just more stuff. It's got to be better and richer experiences, doesn't it? Yeah. Like, it can't just be tech for tech's sake. So if you can more safely operate a construction rig, for example, with a bit of data about the pneumatics of your machine or something, just you know, in your line of sight, off to one side, so you can have a safer work experience that's fantastic if it's just you know if you allow humans to do what humans would do <laughs> just clutter it up with uh, you know, Kardashian newsfeed or something that yep. we're causing chaos yeah uh, so um, you know that's the kind of crazy dance we lead it's it's up to the individual always and that's important we don't want to have, kind of control that stuff too much but mm-hmm. um, Please make it as safe as possible. But in terms of a design studio, the the immersive experience um, is coming. It's a commitment financially for a lot of practices to sort of make the leap, um, because it does make sense to have it internalised as part of the design process, as opposed to something that you outsource. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of big projects, uh, like I think the casino in town, for example, there'd, there'd be a VR room that you can go into and check it out. Yeah as it's an end piece presentation yep. tool as opposed to a design tool we, we like SketchUp because it's it's a on the fly quick and easy to begin with oh I'm a massive advocate of yeah. SketchUp <laughs> and scale so the first thing you know we'll, we'll try and do is put a car or a human in there for scale and then get some context in and then you're away so this is something I tell my students a lot 
even even at a first year level or sometimes even at master's level they don't sometimes they forget the importance of scale and I'm yeah. so glad that you said that so yeah. if you're listening take that advice <laughs> yeah I mean it, st- it started um, I don't know who told me about it years ago but um, when I started drawing uh, say a, a piece of city somewhere um, always draw a car you know because everyone knows what a car looks like to scale yep. in plan view uh, and then a few trees and you get a sense of okay well space is tiny or that space is central park you know yeah so yeah scale and and with the, the scroll mouse on the scroll button on a mouse now um for me i'm not so i don't enjoy the scroll in scroll out in cab for example mm-hmm. bouncing between scales so but a lot of the guys that have only ever known that way of digesting scale and mm. design information it's fine it's not an issue so I think I'm from that generation that's it, it, we need to be able to instantly go into and watch look at that shrub or see the whole park yeah, yeah in an instant yeah, almost. yeah it's it's kind of a, we call it the yo-yo you know it's, <laughs> it's sort of constant validation that the design diagram at the big scale is yep. still hanging together at the detail which is a good way to use it so um, I, I don't uh, I don't comment on individuals points on that sliding scale you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a horses for courses thing mm-hmm. but you um, you definitely need to um, find what works for you and be able to communicate that to your crew yeah, yeah. no that's excellent and I think a lot of people have um, there was a lot of information even I learned about landscape architecture today um, one of the things that I always get is if they're interested in learning about these things where are the best resources uh, whether it's a website or a book um, are there places yeah, okay. where you stay up to date with the latest landscape architecture information yep. are there anything you can recommend yeah the uh, there are a couple of conferences going around um, obviously institute vetted mm-hmm. they're amazing high intensity bursts of learning and I like to get to the national conference um, every year if I can for that very reason and also just meeting people and discussing what's going on um, and then also um, the internet there's some pretty good websites I can flick through to you after this perhaps yeah um, I don't go there as much but I know a lot of the guys do go there just for sort of visual it's not Pinterest there's a couple of landscape <laughs> specific things that um, that's good the guys go to um, but then uh, I think you find inspiration anywhere so it can be um, you know when you're in the bush going for a walk and I was at the beach on the weekend over at Stradbroke and you know just the way the Banksy is coming out of the side of the cliff and with no soil and you're kind of wondering how, you know, I couldn't specify that, they laughed out of the room. <laughs> but um, there it is, you know, it's probably quite old and, and gnarly, but um, use your observations in other areas in life to inform how you work as a designer. That can be going to the, going to the art gallery is one of the best things you can do if you're trying to kind of just get a, an idea going because you'd mm-hmm. be assaulted with, you know, stimuli. And, and that, yeah. that's... And humans trying to deal with that and watching that interaction is really fascinating to me. Yeah. So there are plenty of ways to get inspiration, uh, not just the internet. I would encourage people to actually get outside and use the place to really inform how you think about the problem. Yeah, great. And I think um, that's a very um, relevant piece of advice, I think, for all design disciplines as well. Um, Becoming, I think, a sponge of information wherever you can yeah. gather that data. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Damien, then we've actually gone a little bit over time, oh, but that's sorry. okay. I think the listeners are going to have a ball with this one because <laughs> there was actually a lot of information that you um, detail. Great advice coupled with a lot of specific details as well. So, thank you so much for giving up your time. It's been a pleasure. Hey, it's great. Enjoyed it. Thanks, Rashad. Thank you. Cheers.